are sustainable. Half the world does live sustainably. That's called the Global South. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those differences. Vancouver's consumption is pretty much on par with most high consuming societies around the world. So there are things that we do uh, in Vancouver that we can be proud of that help us uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions relative to other cities in North America, for example, compared to Austin, Texas, but uh, compared to uh, Germany or Japan or other places, let alone, um, I don't know, pick any city <laughs> in uh, Latin America, for example, you know, Vancouver is a much higher gr uh, greenhouse gas emission producer, much higher ecological footprint. So there's a schism here between what we're talking about and what's really happening in terms of the numbers. So next slide. So basically, um, sustainability from an ecological footprint perspective starts here with the planet. We all live on it. We all share it. And there's about 12 billion hectares of ecologically productive land on Earth that we all share, and there's 7 billion people. So living a one-planet lifestyle means that if everyone lived the way that I I don't, but if I was living at one planet, we could all live with an equal, fair, or access to our resources. So that's called an equitable, fair Earth share. Okay, so, so you just simply take those 12 billion, he billion hectares divided by 7 billion people. It's about 1.7 hectares of average biocapacity per person that we could live off of. That's called one planet living, and that's using the ecological footprint as a metric. So next slide. So the way that we measure this is that different kinds of land have different kinds of productivity. There's forest land that we use to uh, extract wood resources and make paper. There's energy land, which is forest land, but exclusively used for the sequestration of carbon dioxide emissions. And carbon dioxide emissions only, because that's all that nature can absorb in the oceans and on the land and in the soils. So we can't absorb or sequester methane, for example. It has to stay in the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's forcing climate uh, change, and it breaks down over several hundred years. And then it could be sequestered in the carbon dioxide form. But nitrous oxides, all these other greenhouse gases, they can't be sequestered directly. So that's why the ecological footprint is only a measure of carbon dioxide sequestration. That's the carbon footprint component part. We also look at grazing land. Um, Cropland, it's probably self-evident where we, um, the most fertile land is the cropland where we're producing food, not just for ourselves, but for our animals as well as for products such as cotton. Urban land is usually considered equivalent to cropland because historically cities emerged in agrarian um, locations where we were able to have access to food. And then fishing area, shouldn't really say land, fishing area is where the ecologically productive uh, zones are for um, marine harvesting, and usually it's the bench lands in the coastal zone areas. Okay, so that's what we're looking at when we look at the ecological footprint. So next slide. So Vancouver's ecological footprint, it's a measure of the demand of nature services, right? It is not really a measure of our sustainability. It might be closer or more accurately a measure of our unsustainability, but it, and it's not a measure of ecological impact either. It is a measure of our demand on nature services. So how much uh, biocapacity is there that's being regenerated on an annual basis versus how much do we demand? In Vancouver, we are demanding about two and a half million global hectares. A global hectare is a hectare with average biocapacity around the whole world. An area about 200 times larger than the city itself. Okay, well, it's not entirely surprising because cities concentrate people. And when you concentrate people, you concentrate demand. You can help people live more efficiently, right? We can walk to the things that we need, to the services we need. So we're living, in some ways, much more efficiently because we're living in cities. But there's some fundamental demands, like the food that we eat. No matter how close together we live, we still need a certain amount of food to support our body mass. So there's always a concentration of demand in cities. And Vancouver's per capita footprint is based in this research on the urban metabolism of the city but only that portion that supports our lifestyle. So the port is excluded, industrial plants and activities are excluded. Why? Because what we're looking at in the ecological footprint is what is the consumption of an individual? So I will measure my consumption from wherever in the world I take the energy and materials to support my lifestyle. And in the same way that if there's export activity going on in our ports, 
whoever benefits by consuming that somewhere else in the world, they'll take that portion. So it would be double counting in the ecological footprint method to count the industrial export activities as well as the consumption. So what we're counting in this research is Vancouver's consumption, all of our consumption on average from wherever in the world we're taking it, less the exports that we're sending out. That makes sense. So to get to One Planet Living, you also see here that there's a senior government services component. It was really hard and I didn't do a lot, I couldn't actually get the research numbers for this. So on average, you might hear numbers like our Canada's ecological footprint is seven global hectares per capita. So that's a much more comprehensive, top-down, national statistic um, that includes more than my study does. My study only includes Vancouver's urban metabolism and only that portion that's supporting directly our lifestyles. But the government services component is that portion of senior government services that also supports our lifestyles here in Vancouver but happens somewhere else. So it might be the military or the treasury or activities in Ottawa. And it's a proxy number, okay? So the top number is the actual urban metabolism and then we add in about 0.76 global hectares per capita, about 18, 20%, which is generally what we benefit from in terms of government services. So in order to get to one planet living, which is 1.7 global hectares per capita, if we take 12 billion hectares of ecologically productive land divided by 7 billion people, it's 1.7 global hectares per capita. And we are living at about five here in Vancouver, maybe even as high as seven by some other study standards. So clearly we're an ecological overshoot and we're not sustainable from this metrics perspective. So next slide. So the sustainability gap for Vancouver is the difference between what we currently demand on average, and I, and I should emphasize this is 2006 data, versus what the world's biocapacity is. So what the world produces every year, on average, if it was gonna support seven billion people all living within their fair earth share, and this is what we demand. And for, for North American or European, Western culture cities, um, this is not uncommon, right? 20% of the world's people consume, or the wealthy in the world, consume 80% of the world's resources, right? So for any high income, high consuming city to call itself sustainable really is a bit of a farce from an ecological accounting perspective, right? So um, not to say that Vancouver's all bad, but just to say that we're really self-referencing against other high consuming, high, um, income countries and the historical consumption levels of this 20% of the global population is what's created all, to date, all of the ecological crisis that we're encountering now. That doesn't mean we don't have real problems coming up as highly populated uh, countries like China are industrializing very quickly, but this is really our challenge to solve. We created this mess, it's our problem and we're certainly not sustainable. So this gap, you can also see most of it is being driven by our cropland and the energy land required to sequester our carbon dioxide emissions only. So it's, it's an underestimate. It would be even higher if you wanted to, to include all the other greenhouse gases. So next slide, please. So this is the same data. It's an ecological footprint, but instead of showing it by land type now, so the previous slide I was showing you by land type, the orange was the uh, carbon sequestration land, the light green was the um, crop land, dark green was forest land, pasture land was yellow. Now I'm showing it by activity, same data, just grouping it by activity. So here you can see that food is the dominant driver in Vancouver's ecological footprint, followed by transportation, then our buildings, then our consumables and waste, and lastly water. And one of the things before we go any further, I'm going to now drill into each one of these pie charts, but I'm not going to talk about water anymore. Only because the way that the ecological footprint measures, we're not looking at the water molecule itself. Water is the biggest moving material in the region, but we're only looking at the energy here used to treat and convey water, and it's small. So um, historically, when, does Walkerton ring a bell? anybody? Okay. When Walkerton happened, Metro Vancouver uh, decided to invest in an upgraded water treatment system. Our energy tripled 
in terms of water delivery in this region. But it's still relatively low compared to other places because we benefit from a predominantly gravity-fed system. And so let's just stop with that. So the main message here is the ecological footprint's a valuable metric to look at our demand on nature services relative to supply, but it's not the only metric we should be using. Okay, next slide. So in the study, for each one of the components, food, buildings, transportation, consumables and waste, I look at the materials. So how much land is required to produce the materials we consume? The, uh, this is broken down into two types of materials, but then the embodied energy. Uh, so there's energy that's used in the supply chain production of something that's embodied energy. The operating energy, for example, running the lights in this building, that would be uh, uh, operating energy, but the energy used to make this wall, that would be embodied energy. And then the built area itself, the square footage of the land that it occupies. So for food, we see that the land in an ecological footprint perspective required to produce our crops is the number one driver in that food component. Do you remember food was the half footprint of our footprint? demand for grazing our animals. But it doesn't mean here that th we're eating all of this. Half of this is land that we're using to feed our animals. So highly fertile cropland that we're using to feed our animals. And that's a big driver in the footprint because it's something like nine pounds of grain for one pound of meat instead of just eating nine pounds of grain yourself. The embodied energy is significant, but look at the food miles. Operating energy is food miles here, really small. So again, like water, it doesn't mean that this isn't an important issue. Food miles for fruits and vegetables is quite significant, but when you take it in the whole perspective from an ecological footprint perspective, what you eat is way more important than where it came from. Okay, so not saying it's, it's not important to eat local and organic, it is, but what you're eating, if you're eating meat or legumes, it's an even bigger choice. So let's go to the next slide. Same data for food that I just showed you, but now I'm showing it by food type. Okay, so same data. So here you see that fish, meat, and eggs is the predominant portion. So do you remember the footprint was half of our total? So you could say that meat is a quarter <laughs> of that total because it's half of this half. Um, and the majority, what I don't show here, is about 67% of this red is red meat only. The rest is white meat and fish and eggs. Uh, so it's a really important piece of, of the ecological footprint. Okay, next slide. Now here we're in buildings. So this one tracks very similarly to the way that the city looks at its greenhouse gas emissions. So operating energy is the driver. Residential and commercial almost equally split. The embodied energy is higher here in the residential sector. And for people who are used to greenhouse gas emission inventorying, this is also gonna seem a bit strange. It's because in the residential, which is largely wood construction, we're counting the land area required to produce the wood. Whereas concrete, which has a very, very high greenhouse gas emission coefficient for the production of concrete, but it has a very long-lived life. So the commercial buildings, the concrete that gets poured, tends, tends to stay in place much longer than the houses. So if you're ripping down your houses and renovating and building bigger houses, you're definitely driving the footprint up for the embodied energy piece. Okay, next step. This is consumables and waste. And what's interesting here is that in the city, we focus a lot on waste, but that's because that's what the city has jurisdiction and domain over. In fact, if we're serious about sustainability and we're interested in reducing our ecological footprint, we would be more focused on the consumable side. So here you see the green and the orange, the very, very small slivers at the top. That's all the energy and land involved in managing our waste systems. But the dark blue, the light blue, and the dark red, that's, the blue is the materials, and this is the um, energy in the supply chain. So the dark blue, it says materials disposed. The dark blue is what you actually touch. The coffee cup, the microphone, the computer, the, pa the piece of paper. That's what you touch that ends up in the waste stream. That's the materials used to, the things you touch. The light blue and the red, that's the supply chain. The stuff you never see, but the materials that were used to produce that little dark blue part. And the pink is the energy associated with the recycling of products. So for example, in Vancouver, we recycle about 70% of our paper, which is fantastic, but there's always an energy tag associated with it. So we don't count the materials twice.
so the message here is you can't get to one planet living by recycling everything. You have to reduce consumption. You just have to. So next piece. Thank you. <laughs> You're good at this. <laughs> Uh, so here we're in transportation, again, familiar to people who are uh, looking at cities' greenhouse gas emission inventory. The energy in the operating fleet is the predominant driver for greenhouse gas emissions. The embodied energy in the, bil in the vehicles is significant, um, and so is the air travel. I didn't count the embodied energy in the air, in the, the planes, um, but we do count the, um, the built area of the roads and the embodied energy for um, the roads is very small. You can barely see it up there, the light pink. That has, again, to do with the, the longevity of the roads. And what's not counted here is the asphalt. So that, that would be higher still. So the ecological footprint is an underestimate. I did the very best I could to capture the data that I had access to, but it's an underestimate. So the big message here, to get to One Planet Living, we really, and no new news, <laughs> we have to get out of our cars. Not just a little bit. Like, to get to One Planet Living, we would have to be 86% of our trips by walking, cycling, and transit, and 50% less vehicles on the road. Now, if we were all walking and cycling and taking transit, and that was easy to do in the city, it would probably be easier for us to give up our vehicles. But we have to address both the embodied energy and the operating energy in this section, and reducing our flying. So it doesn't mean you can never fly, but you know, an annual trip here and there wouldn't be part of, part of, the, part of the picture, probably. So that's, that's what our footprint looks like in a nutshell, and I'll be very happy to answer questions or get into the debate when in the panel discussion, I guess, right? Thank you.